what I'm going to talk about, much of it has been encapsulated in the paper that Rebecca Brown and I have just produced, which I think can be seen as one of the early steps in producing a shared evidence base for use by a whole range of professionals, both those working in the family justice system, but also those working throughout um, children's services, people who have responsibilities for safeguarding children in order to aid decision making, to provide the evidence that you need on which to, um, which can inform some of the really key decisions that you have to make. I'm going to be looking at three specific questions. One of them is to what extent is there a mismatch between time frames for childhood development, particularly in the early years, and time frames for decision making in children's services. How does it happen if there is a mismatch, and I think that there is, and what might we do to address it? I'm going to focus specifically on very young children, children under the age of one. The paper that Becky and I have produced covers a much wider age range of children, but we think that children under the age of one are particularly important, partly because, well, listen to this, they're three times as likely as others to become the subject of child protection plans due to physical abuse. They're more than twice as likely as other children to be subjects of child protection plans in response to neglect. They're the subjects of nearly half, 45% of serious case reviews, and they have eight times the, the average risk of child homicide. So if you're a baby and you're subject to abuse and neglect, there are serious consequences for your life chances. We've known a bit about early childhood development for a long time, but over, I think, about the last 10 years, there have been substantial advances, and those are really pertinent, and I think that people who work in this specific area need to be really aware of what the new research is telling us. We've known from a very early age that the relationship between the child and the primary caregiver, usually the mother, is really key to the development of attachment. What I don't think we've known nearly so much about is how this relationship mediates pretty well every aspect of early childhood development. Um, and in fact, it shapes the development of the brain and the central nervous system. It has an impact on children's cognitive development, but it also impacts on the child's ability to negotiate key developmental tasks such as impulse control, the development of trust and attachment. And that really is a basis for a wide area of emotional, social and behavioural development. Child development timescales are really important in this area. We know that the brain develops particularly rapidly in the first two years of life, but the majority of neurons are formed pre-birth. So what happens to you before you're born, when you're in the womb, has an impact on the rest of your life, something that I don't think we take into account sufficiently. The relationship, the, the interaction, the quality of this interaction with your primary caregiver, and I think I'm going to call this person the mother, just for the sake of argument, for the rest of this talk, the, your, the sensitivity of, of that attachment at 6 to 15 weeks correlates with the way in which um, very young children relate at 18 months. So really, in the very few first few weeks of life, that attachment starts to develop and starts to shape the way in which the child, the child advances, the child progresses. There is very interesting research that shows, for instance, that babies who are placed for adoption before their first birthdays are more likely to develop secure attachments to their adoptive carers than those who are placed afterwards. Those are the sort of time frames that we need to be aware of when making decisions about what should happen to these very vulnerable children. The baby learns to regulate their emotions through the process of attachment and they begin to stabilise the way in which they respond to stress at around six months of age. The way in which your mother picks you up and strokes you and comforts you and murmurs to you while, while they're trying to calm you down, helps you deal with stress. If you don't get that sort of response from your mother, then there, well, from your primary caregiver, then there could be difficulties. Language comprehension also, also begins very early on, within the first two years. 
So what's the impact of abuse and neglect on this process? Well, there is evidence from the Romanian orphans, but also from studies done in the United States on children who have been very severely neglected, that severe global neglect in the first three years of life literally stunts the growth of the brain. The problem is, too, that the brain adapts as readily to negative as to, posit as to a positive environment. So children who are persistently maltreated develop different reactions to stress. They don't adapt, they, they become maladapted to stress and they, they deal with it in a way that isn't necessarily helpful to themselves or to others. And we are particularly concerned, the, the latest research suggests that frightened or frightening parental behaviour is associated with disorganised attachments um, from about the age of 12 to 18 months. So at Loughborough we have been following a cohort of very young children um, who were identified as likely to be abused or neglected, likely to suffer significant harm before their first birthdays. We have been following these children um, until, first of all, till they were three, and then again until they were five, and we're hoping to follow them for a bit longer. Some parents are capable of changing and making enormous changes overcoming enormous adversities. And about a third of the children in our sample, when they were three, were living with parents who had really overcome great difficulties, often had had another child placed for adoption, but since then had got over, got over things, turned their lives around, and were providing very nurturing homes for these children. At three also, about a third of the children had been permanently separated from their birth families. However, just under a third of them were staying with birth parents who hadn't really turned their lives around. They were suffering from abuse and neglect, from parents who had major difficulties to contend with. About half the children, by the time they were three, had experienced some abuse and neglect. Many of them, while they were um, being supported, while they were open cases in children's social care. And over half the children at three were beginning to display quite substantial emotional and behavioural difficulties. If we look at the children when they were five, we can see that things were not so good at five as they were at three for many of these children. That, I think, is a major cause for concern. You'd hope that things got better for these children, but for many of them, they got worse. At five, we still have these emotional behavioural difficulties and they are becoming entrenched. These are, these are really quite serious issues. There are children in the sample, for instance, who have very, very aggressive behaviour patterns. There is, for instance, one child who at three couldn't be left alone with a foster carer's baby, the, the grandchild, I think, of the foster carer, because he tried to attack the baby. There was another child who couldn't be left alone with a family pet for the same reason. We have a five-year-old in the sample who is self-harming at five, shutting his fingers indoors, trying to hurt himself. Um, there are children who have really quite substantial behavioural difficulties in this study. And most of those were evident at three and are more established at five. And perhaps one of the key issues for you to be aware of is that those difficulties were more prevalent amongst children who were late separated, those who were permanently separated, but after having been subject to several months, if not years, of abuse and neglect, and more prevalent amongst those who were living with their birth families and not adequately safeguarded. So there are really key issues here for time frames for decision making for these children. In our sample, for instance, and remember, these children were all identified before their first birthdays, most of them before they were six months old, many of them even before birth. Nevertheless, it took on average 14 months for a definitive decision to be made. That is, the decision um, that was still in place when they were three. It took 14 months before that was made. You think about it, you have a six-month-old baby 14 months, they're 20 months old before anybody decides that this child is going to be permanently separated or is going to stay with their birth parents. 20 months. It took another six months for that decision to be implemented. So, for instance, if the decision is for permanent, for permanent um, 
placement somewhere. You might have another six months in a temporary placement pending that happening. So that means, what, 26 months, two years old, before you reach your permanent home. And indeed, longer if it's an adoptive home, another five months if, an if it's an adoptive home. Also, there were no new permanence decisions made between three and five, so there weren't any changes. Some of the children who continued to be abused and neglected remained with their birth parents. Nobody was separated after they were three. We do know, though, from anecdotal information, as we're still visiting these families, that some of the children who have been the greatest concern, we felt, um, at six or seven years old are beginning to be placed in care. At six or seven, your chances of having a secure placement in care are diminished, and your chances of finding an adoption family are greatly diminished. So there are big issues there for time frames. So I think we can agree that there is a mismatch between time frames for decision making and time frames for early childhood development. So why does it happen? I think that's perhaps a really important question. I think you need to look right through the system, not only at what happens in the courts, but what has happened to the child before they come to the attention of the courts. There, because there are delays right along, and we need to look at this systematically, rather than just look at one chunk of the system without regard to the others. Throughout the whole process, we found in our study, for instance, that the least intrusive action is preferred. So, for instance, if a child can be um, supported under family support measures as a, an ordinary child in need, you don't go for a child protection plan. If you can deal with a situation with a child protection plan, you don't go to the courts. If you can um, request a supervision order rather than a care order, you go for the supervision order. Very often before going to the courts, um, the local authority will arrange a written contract with the parents, a written agreement. It doesn't have any legal force, but it sets out what the expectations of both parties are. But we also found that many of the, the written agreements in our study are broken and that there are no further consequences for the parents. Some of the parents in our study had had several consecutive written agreements that had consecutively been broken without legal action being taken. And of course the legal departments in local authorities have to be very careful where they take action and they're often very reluctant to act in neglect and emotional abuse cases where there hasn't been a crisis because proving the long-term corrosive impact of neglect and abuse is much harder than proving that a child has been abandoned overnight, for instance. There are all sorts of practical issues that impact on the speed with which decisions can be made. Silly things like it takes two weeks for the minutes of a meeting to be written up and distributed, for instance. Um, things like court timetables, of course, another issue that can, de that can delay a process. There are concerns about repeated assessments of parenting capacity, which I'll come, come back to in a minute, and assessments of kinship carers. We found in our study, for instance, that virtually anybody who has the remotest relationship to a child can come forward and say that they're a relation. Some of the relations who who were assessed in our study, and all these assessments were undertaken consecutively, not concurrently, some of the relations were really not going to have a hope of looking after the child, but they had to be eliminated before, before anyone could move on to assessing somebody who might be more viable. And some of the relations who were assessed in our study had never met the family, had never met the parents before, had never met the child before. So we need to ask, I think, when is, when is a relative a relative? At what point do you say, actually, this is such a distant relative that are there really going to be any benefits for this child for being placed with them? The issue about assessing parenting capacity, I think, is, is a really important one. Some, a number of specialist assessments are undertaken because the courts don't really trust the judgment of the local authority, so they ask for them to re be repeated. Others are undertaken simply because the, um, there isn't a core assessment in the case file and there isn't evidence that the local authority has done a full assessment. But we found two really important things, I think. One is that there are repeated assessments of the same parents with very little gap in between to see whether things had improved. 
Sometimes, many of the parents in our study, for instance, were going through care and adoption proceedings with an older child while they were pregnant with the baby in our study, sometimes after the baby was born. They may have had a negative parenting assessment for the older child, but they were still assessed for the baby as though things might be different. And basically, they weren't different. If they'd had a negative assessment a few months previously, they very rarely had changed um, in, in the intervening time. There needs to be an adequate time span between assessments, and that would reduce delay. And many of the assessments in our study were over-optimistic. Um, we found, for instance, that two-thirds of the parenting assessments in our study advised that the child should remain with their birth parents, but by the time they were three, over half of these children had had to be removed. They were over-optimistic, and that increased the delay in making a viable permanent resolution for these children. Another issue that we found was all the focus is on the parenting assessments. We didn't find a single paediatric assessment of the impact of the abuse and neglect on the child's developmental processes. That might be something that one would focus on that, would, that could speed things up for these children and provide evidence that the courts need at a much earlier stage. Elaine Farmer's study on neglected children returning home um, found, for instance, that's Farmer and Lutman, they found that proactive social work case management started to diminish um, after, after children were six years old, from children as young as six years old, people started to take less proactive actions. Attention starts to drop off from about the age of five or six, and then, of course, these children re-emerge as adolescents who have been neglected throughout their lives with consequent difficulties. A number of the children who'd been separated in our study had experienced two major difficulties. First of all, they had spent lengthy periods in very abusive, neglectful families before they were removed. So they had all the consequences of that um, neglect and abuse to deal with. And then they had sometimes been placed with very nurturing, temporary foster carers. They had maybe formed a close attachment to the foster carer, but then they had been moved on to an adoptive carer. They had had to suffer the experience of um, bereavement, really, bereavement and loss, the end of that close, the only close relationship that they had had. So they'd really learnt twice over that you can't trust adults. They're not going to be there, or if they are there, they may, they may hurt you. There's evidence also from the Farmer and Lutman study about the consequences of care plans. They found that 62%, almost two-thirds of care plans made by the court are not actually carried out. There are reasons, of course, things change very often between the court making the decision and being able to implement it, but almost two-thirds weren't carried out. They also found that supervision orders can be very ineffective. Uh, again, about two-thirds of the supervision orders in their study hadn't been effective in safeguarding the child. The child had to return to care or a care order had had to be made. There are major issues about court-mandated placements. Um, Farmer and Lutman found that 87% of those break down placements with own parents. 87% of court-mandated placements with own parents break down. And about two-thirds of maltreated children who return home from care or accommodation are subsequently readmitted. There's evidence from a study by Nina Bihal and colleagues that shows that maltreated children who are placed away from home um, in adoption, special guardianship or in long-term foster care do better than those who remain with their birth families. There's also a study by Jim Wade and colleagues that shows, really, I think this is a really good study. It's methodologically outstanding and the findings are really interesting. They compared children who were in care who they compared those who stayed in care with those who returned home. They're all neglected and abused children. That's the reason why they had come into care. They found that those who went home did better both in terms of well-being and also stability than those who went home. So the care system is not nearly as ineffective as you might think it was if all you did was read the, read the media. And there are issues about delayed decisions and um, placement instability. There is a close relationship between putting off a decision and children's need to move from one placement to another. 
because until there is a definitive decision, those children will be in temporary placements and they will move from one temporary placement to another without anybody thinking this has to be a permanent solution for this child. I think there is a really good case to be made for more feedback to the courts and to expert assessors about the outcomes of the decisions that they make and the recommendations that they make. If you find that most of your positive recommendations turn out to have been overly optimistic in the long run, that should surely lead you to question some of the decisions that you're making. I think one could perhaps do something about identifying where delays occur within the family justice system, looking perhaps at some individual cases, monitoring exactly why there have been delays and seeing whether that might give some general information, some general indicators about factors that could be addressed. Better, admin, uh, better administrative support, for instance, might make quite a difference, I would have thought. And of course, the under, some understanding of the impact of delay, I think, should inform decisions about the welfare of the child. And there are a number of things that can be done. One of the things, of course, is to speed up the adoption process, and that's, that's actually the route that has been taken at the moment. So you make faster decisions. There are more children, maybe more children should be placed for adoption, and there are certainly incentives now, there are encouragement for um, local authorities to place more children for adoption. There are new targets, there are benchmarking for these decisions and so on. That could be in the interests of children, and certainly the research evidence suggests that decisions should be made more quickly and that action should be taken faster. Though whether more children or many more children would be suitable for adoption, I think is not necessarily the case. But if there is a huge incentive on placing more children for adoption, there will be more children who are unnecessarily separated from their birth families. Remember, some of the families in our study succeeded in turning their lives around. So there'll be real concerns for that. I think that adoption will only really be suitable for a relatively small number of children. And I think also there's a lot of evidence that adoptive parents are likely to need long-term support. So what can be done? What other ways forward might there be? We could have much more effective and timely services. More timely assessment, for instance. Pre-birth assessment. There are a number of evidence-based programmes which have been shown to be effective. And I think more use could be made of them. There should be better integration of some of the initiatives taken by schools, I think. Some of the schools in our studies were incredibly nurturing of the children. They provided specific programs for specific children, but they weren't part of a strategic plan for the child. So when the child moved to a new teacher, for instance, or moved to a new school, there was no guarantee that that intensive nurturing would continue. There aren't very good processes for stepping down from intensive services so that parents might get a very intensive bit of support and then that was that, the case was closed. And in fact, some of the parents that we interviewed who had had support from children's social care and were doing well, found that they were found to be doing all right after really quite a short period of time, six months perhaps, something like that. And then the case was closed. Some of the parents asked to have the child protection plan extended because they felt that they needed somebody to rely on, they needed somebody to be keeping an eye on them in order to help them maintain the changes that they had made. So processes for stepping down, for providing much less intensive support, but some sort of, not only monitoring, but also some support for families might be very valuable. We know, we know what the primary risk factors from our treatment are, substance misuse, domestic and community violence, mental health problems and experience of abuse in childhood. We need really to try to help parents overcome them and address them, but we also need to address some of the stresses from some of the secondary factors that cause additional stress in families that make issues such as substance misuse much more likely in families. And those are, those are things like poverty, things like unemployment, poor housing, isolation, social exclusion and inequality. We need to be able to address those in families. I think addressing those factors is a necessary step towards reducing the prevalence of abuse and neglect. I also think, sadly, 
that some of the new policies on, on welfare reform particularly are likely to exacerbate those factors rather than to, to address them.